Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the SETA Foundation at Washington, D.C. Uh, for a discussion on Obama's Syria policy. Um, my colleague, uh, Kulich Kanat, um, our research director here at SETA, D.C., has published a book titled A Tale of Four Augusts, Obama's Syria Policy. We'll take this opportunity to reflect upon the administration's policy over the past uh, four or five years now, more than four years. Um, and as you are already very well aware of uh, the situation in Syria, it's simply getting worse, and it has gotten worse over the past several years. Um, the humanitarian crisis has reached unprecedented levels. Uh, security risks keep increasing and getting complicated uh, and becomes more and more unmanageable um, and nobody seems to have a magic wand obviously um, and the most recent uh, crisis of migrants in Europe hit the headlines once again to highlight the Syrian crisis, Syrian civil war and its regional uh, impact. Um, many fo calls for action have been repeated over the years uh, but there has been no major international intervention that could actually remedy uh, these problems. Um, today we want to discuss uh, where the Obama administration's policy falls in all this. Uh, how has the US, um, US Syria policy evolved or you know, not evolved in certain respects? Uh, what are the major turning points? Um, our, our colleague um, Kulich Kanat wrote a systematic uh, treatment of the administration's policy with actually a couple of chapters on the Bush years and the pre-Obama years to give a broader perspective on this. It's a very well researched uh, uh, book. Uh, we're proud to promote that right here. Uh, and you should um, check it out. I think we have some copies at the front, but also it can be purchased online on Amazon. Um, so, there you go. <laughs> um, to, to discuss uh, the administration policy, we have a great panel uh, today. Uh, we have uh, Kulich Kanat, our, as I mentioned, uh, my colleague here. Uh, we have Ambassador Frederick Hoff, Senior Fellow at the Rafiq Hariri Center for the Middle East at Atlantic Council, and Nicholas Harris. Uh, he's a research associate at Middle East Security Program at the ne Center for a New American Security, CNAS. Uh, we welcome them as well. Thank you for your contribution uh, in advance. And I'll, I'll turn to my colleague Kulich uh, and ask him to outline uh, what he discussed in the book and then take us perhaps to today, and then we'll have a discussion both on the book and also where we are today and what are the possibilities or impossibilities about Syrian situation right now. So, uh, Klutch, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, the uh, book starts actually with the Bush years, and since 2001, uh, pre-September 11 and post-September 11, how U.S. policy actually evolved and transformed constantly about Syria. If we do not count the last four years of uh, kind of stable action, uh, maybe inaction of the Obama administration, we see that immediately after 9-11, a dramatic change in U.S. relation with Syria, actually. Syria has become one of the first countries that support the war on terror and started to share intelligence with the U.S. immediately after 9-11. And some of these intelligence was actionable intelligence. And in a couple instances, one of the more prominent one is uh, with the intelligence that Syrian government provided, U.S. prevented a glider bomb attack to, in Bahrain, to its fleet in Bahrain. It was a similar type of attack like USS Cole. But the relations started to get sour suddenly with the uh, U.S. invasion of Iraq. So Syria became... Uh, again now the, one of the first countries that opposed the war in Iraq and uh, especially the President Bush uh, freedom agenda and the regime change. Uh, the main 
perception in Damascus was the next target would be uh, Syria after the Iraq war. So the, with the extension of Iraq war 2004-2005, the relation, the sourness in the relation become a bitter situation with the uh, US uh, intelligence about the Syrian, for some it is support, for some it is tolerance for the uh, free flow of the jihadist groups, especially the, the groups that will form Al-Qaeda in Iraq that basically uh, that support them to go from Syria to uh, uh, Iraq and fight against US forces. And in multiple different instances, the relations went really bad. There was some discussion within the administration. It was well reported about how to handle the Syrian crisis. Because at the same time, there was this issue of Kibar nuclear reactor, and US was also concerned about the nuclear facility of uh, Syria. But well, nuclear facility was handled by Israel, one way or another. And following that, the main problem became foreign fighter. And when we approached the Obama years, 2008 actually, this issue became the main uh, issue of tension between two countries. In several different instances, US sent uh, some signals, messages to administration. Of course, we had Hariri assassination in the midst of this. Even there was in 2006, 2007, there was a plan by David Petros, and he asked permission from president to go to Damascus and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with President Assad at that time and solve this problem. But administration didn't uh, kind of respond positively with that. And in 2008, just before the end of the uh, administration, there was a military attack, actually, the, uh, a major attack by the US forces in Syria to uh, what they call the training ground of some uh, terrorist groups in Syria. With the Obama administration, actually, the situation suddenly changed because Obama administration considered Syria very important for its three main policy objectives in Middle East. The first one was withdrawal of US forces from Iraq. And in order to withdraw the forces, Obama administration believed that they have to stabilize Iraq. And stabilization of Iraq would be a part of it would be to stop the flow of the foreign fighters from Damascus, uh, from Syria to Iraq. The second one was Obama administration was has some agenda about Middle East peace. And they considered the Israeli Syria Israeli track an important part of that and the third one was isolating Iran in the region and in order to isolate Iran in the region to get the support of Syria to normalize relations with Syria is considered as one of the main tenants because of that immediately after actually in February 2009 immediately after the inauguration ceremony the relations some kind of uh, yes gesture started Hillary Clinton shook hands with uh, Walid Muallim in uh, Sharm el Sheikh, and then U.S. formed a delegation formed by Daniel Shapiro and Ambassador Feldman and sent them to Damascus, and the real conversation started. And Assad was really ready for this because Assad was the, its economy was crumbling with the sanctions, especially its aviation industry was crumbling. The Syrian airlines was basically becoming. Uh, very vulnerable to any kind of mechanical errors, mechanical problems, and uh, economic problems could create some kind of internal domestic dissent. So Bashar Assad at that point really welcomed this gesture, and he actually in first interview after the Daniel Shapiro and Feldman's visit, he was on TV in Syria, and he said he really wants to talk with President Obama and solve this problem you know, like the, by having a conversation with him. Well, President uh, Obama's, again, the first strategy was, of course, Iraq. And in order to solve that problem, uh, United States decided to give some kind of two different strategies. One was uh, supporting the Syrian troops at the border with some night vision goggles and technology that they can uh, monitor the border. The second one was, uh, instead of focusing on Syria about the foreign fighters, they decided, the US intelligence decided to go back to the source countries and stop 
cooperate with the source countries so that they can stop the flow of refugees to Damascus even before they reach to Damascus, actually. Because in uh, Bush years, there was a plan, you know, like the, uh, with some uh, discussion about bombing Damascus airport so that, you know, like the, the flights, the, there cannot be no flights, you know, like the, so in order to solve the foreign fighter problem, it was considered as a solution. Well, it worked relatively, especially the intelligence field, it worked relatively well. The second, uh, because of that, there was constant interaction with this. Imad Mustafa, the US Syrian ambassador here, had uh, meetings at the State Department and at certain point, uh, undersecretary went to Damascus to meet with. And at the same time, congressional support was really high for this, especially Senator Kerry at that time visited Syria six times in two years and become, you know, the appointment of United States in Syria. So the things were moving fast. There was some resistance from the Congress, especially after uh, Maliki complained about the Baghdad bombings and blamed Damascus about those bombings. But the problem was solved, and in a, a congressional reset, Ambassador Ford was appointed as the ambassador to Syria. The second part was the uh, Syria Israeli track was sub started. It was quietly started, actually, uh, by st uh, State Department and uh, U.S. administration. It was going well. And many people, according to the WikiLeaks documents, many people believe that the third pillar was working as well. Third pillar was isolating Iran by, you know, like the getting the support of the Assad regime. So according to them, in the closed, uh, uh, closed door conversations, it was really going well. So the, the breaking point came with the Arab Spring. Arab Spring, and we know what happened, but there was four different August because of that. The book's name is the four statement or four policy decisions of President Obama in four different August. So the, when the Arab Spring started, actually, we see contradictory messages from the administration. First, they said, well, it may be a reformer. Even uh, in uh, one of the Sunday morning shows, Hillary Clinton said, according to congressional delegation, he could be a reformer, you know, like the, we should give him more time. And then uh, Senator Kerry, actually, in Carnegie, in a talk at Carnegie Institute, said similar things that we should give him time. It may not be the same like Libya. This may be a little different. But when we were coming to June, July, the situation changed, especially Ambassador uh, Ford's visit to Hama in summer 2011. And the constant uh, pressure from the press, from the public opinion, made the administration to you know, like to say something about this. Until that point, there was criticism. But August 2011, President Obama made that speech about Assad must go, Assad must step aside. And, uh, and others, you know, like the for a more, you know, like the pluralistic and, you know, like the democratic form of, you know, like the government. When, we, when I look and when I talk with the people who had some idea about who involved in this decision, most of them were said to me that they were really surprised when President Obama made this statement because they were expecting uh, that President Obama will do something, but there was no strategy behind that rhetoric. So if President Obama is saying that, President Assad should step aside. There should be some kind of policy options for the president. But nobody was aware of any kind of policy procedure or, you know, like the, the steps that, will, that President Obama will take after that. So there was mostly the criticism was, well, it was a rhetorical statement. So the expectation was step aside means it will be, you know, like the, a very a significant deterrent will create a significant deterrent effect for uh, Assad. And the expectation was, well, uh, in Libya, in Tunisia, you know, in, partly in Libya, but in Egypt, we see that when people, you know, like the, join these demonstrations, at the end of the day, the administration, the regime will end. So the expectation was, well, we have to make a statement because we have to be on the right side of the history, right? Because if the regime falls next week, we would be behind the history. So let's make the statement and watch, you know, like the, because after this statement, uh, Assad probably will not use force, overwhelming force against the population. So the demonstration will spread to whole country, especially Aleppo was critical. They were expecting a demonstrations in Aleppo. So at the end of the day, they, it will fall by itself and we would be on the right side of, of the history. 
So it didn't happen, of course, and we came to 2012. And 2012 was an unfortunate year for uh, Syria because it was an election year in the US and nobody, uh, there wasn't any significant criticism by the Republicans about the US foreign policy, especially in terms of Syria. Because President Obama gave the message, did some multilateral, uh, initiate some multilateral policy options, especially at UN, and it didn't work. So in mid-2012, there was some, in summer especially, there was some discussion about the chemical weapons. And whether there will be any chemical weapon use, can Assad use chemical weapons? Because US intelligence intercepted some movements of chemical weapons. And President Obama on the 23rd of August made that speech, another speech, another August, and said it will be its red line. And again, uh, when I talk with the people who has some information about the policy process, they again told me that, well, it was the last question in a press conference, and press conference was not related to that. Chuck Todd was sitting in the front seat and asked this question, and he wasn't, well, he responded and he said it will be red line, but there wasn't any policy, you know, like the steps that either military or State Department or any other agency in the US administration prepared. So following this, of course, in 2012, there was Benghazi attack, which kind of uh, influenced the, according to many, influenced the decision making of President Obama about Syria as well. The Libya experience and the, assassin, the killing of the US ambassador in Libya kind of uh, uh, caused, uh, you know, like the, even those who had some uh, eagerness or appetite to have a military involvement to stop that. And when we, uh, in late 2012, actually, the first reports of the chemical attacks came. First in uh, foreign policy reported one, Le Monde in mid to, uh, in uh, March 2013, Le Monde actually reported a very detailed story about chemical attacks. It wasn't phosphor use, it was this time, it was really mm -hmm. sarin gas use to the civilian uh, population centers. But what happened is, uh, actually, in June, US intelligence confirmed this, June uh, 2013. And there was, again, debate about the, in the administration about what to do about these chemical attacks. But later, administration and many former administration officials understand that Assad was actually testing the waters, using different kind of chemical agents and when U.S. Could, didn't do anything, and it was in the first anniversary of Red Line speech, just one year after the Red Line speech, we see a huge chemical attack in Ghouta. So now it is another August. This time the people, especially Syrian opposition, international community is expecting a really a, a <coughs> strong military action by the United States because it was the violation of an international norm. It could be a, you know, like there was different, you know, like the arguments for this. But President Obama, even starting from his first interview on TV, started to give some signals that, well, it will be, we will attack, of course, but those attacks may not be against the administration targets. So we will try to degrade the command and control structures of chemical weapons instead of attacking or trying to pursue a regi regime change. So again, there was some kind of confusion and military was ready for the attack, but suddenly President Obama, actually David Rothkopf reported that it was really sudden. It was after a, a half an hour conversation on, uh, in the Rose Garden with Dennis McDonough that President Obama changed his mind. And everybody in the Oval Office was expecting President Obama's press conference. And President Obama, just before the press conference came and he said, he had a better idea now that instead of attacking Syria, let's get the congressional approval for this. And although President Obama may meant, you know, like the uh, uh, kind of uh, getting the approval of the Congress for practical reasons, the real uh, both Syrian opposition and international community understood that President Obama will not do anything about this because it was a very hostile Congress and nobody was expecting this to pass from the Congress easily. And immediately after this, of course, we see a statement by John Kerry. And I tried to ask people from 
uh, former State Department officials, former administration officials, journalists about this question because that question was, again, nobody was expecting that. And there wasn't any talking point about this. The question was, is there any way that Assad can avoid a military strike by the United States? And the response was something nobody was expecting and nobody had, you know, like the prepared for. The statement was, well, if he gives up all chemical weapons, he will probably avoid a military attack. And the same day, actually, State Department spokesperson at that time said, well, it is a rhetorical statement showing that Assad will not do this and we will continue with the military strike. So even State Department spokespersons were not aware of the, you know, like the, if there's a policy change. Of course, Russia initiative started and it kind of relieved the administration. And administration liked the idea and accepted the fact that without chemical weapons, you know, like the, it would be good. It would be a smart choice according to administration because even with the military strikes, you couldn't destroy all of the chemical weapons. And this gives you a chance that you can, you know, like basically destroy the chemical weapons before the regime falls or before the, those chemical weapon stockpiles would be in the hands of another organization, right? A terrorist organization in the region. So another August passed and it created, I guess, uh, in the administration's policy in Syria and credibility about the Syria, it created the biggest damage because one, the, uh, administration was planning the strike, so State Department started to call the governments to support this. And many governments, especially, for, for example, Japanese government, who is kind of, you know, a passive government, very anti-militaristic society, Pres Pre Prime Minister Abe decided to support it. And he made an announcement on TV, created public reaction against that. But he was expecting that this will happen, so we should be on the same boat. Turkey as well, Turkey said, you know, on the first day that Turkey will fully support this. But without informing the allies, U.S. changed its mind. And suddenly, both, you know, like the, when you talk with the Japanese foreign policy uh, experts, they find that Abe in a very weird position that, well, he become the hawkish, he become more hawkish than President Obama about a chemical attack in Syria that Japan has nothing, no interest in. So this created a major, I, I think, credibility gap for the administration. And Following that, of course, the Geneva II process failed, and everybody knew that the tragedy is everybody knew that it will fail, and basically it failed. And the, in, when we start in 2014, the, uh, the main discussion become ISIS. And again, the administration didn't have much policy uh, a strategy against ISIS because of that in David Remnick's interview, President Obama came out and said, called ISIS as a JV team and said, you know, like the, you cannot call every, you know, like the athlete who wears Kobe Bryant shirt, you know, like that's Kobe Bryant, right? So if they have Al-Qaeda flag, you cannot, you know, like call them Al-Qaeda. It may not be that powerful. But in March, you know, like the, and April in intelligence reports was basically telling that Homeland Security, NSA director, everybody was saying that, well, this organization may be a little more challenging than a JV team for US security. And June, Mosul fell. And at that point, kind of uh, first President Obama <coughs> said, well, our intelligence didn't give this information about, you know, like possible fall of Mosul. Then intelligence, there was leaks saying that, well, we gave this, but administration basically didn't want to do anything. There was this confusion. And this, this gives a weird message to international community that, you know, like the who's ruling the country and who is, you know, like that. There was reports at this point, David Sanger's report on New York Times, basically showing that President Obama in Syria meetings play with his BlackBerry, doesn't have any interest. And there was more, uh, I think, damaging things for US foreign policy that Dennis McDonough told some congressional um, Congress members that, well, uh, ISIS and Hezbollah is, uh, Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah is killing each other, so statu quo may be better for US interest in Syria. So these things add up, and uh, in August, another turning point became with the beheading of uh, Jim Foley and Stephen Setloff. And this time, it basically, uh, it after, you know, like the many people called this after 9-11, the most significant terrorist, you know, like in terms of creating public opinion and publicity, the most significant terrorist attack, you know, like the two US civilians. And 
When they died, this time U.S. had to do something. But this time President Obama became more honest actually and said, well, at the beginning it's, he said, well, we don't have much strategy about ISIS. Then in September, a coalition was formed. And since then, the fight becomes totally against ISIS and Assad regime was forgotten. So now in the, the current situation will be evaluated by Ambassador Hof and uh, our, our panel actually. But what happened at this point is now there is a constant uh, 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 fight against ISIS. But even started from the beginning, many people argued that the strategy will not work. right? And Chuck Hagel actually told, you know, like the before his resignation, that this strategy may not work, and we may fail. Actually, you know, like the defeating ISIS may be degraded, but destroying ISIS with this strategy itself. And uh, at this point, we come to a situation that Assad regime was totally forgotten, and many people consider that that red line statement and U.S. action as something that U.S. is giving green light for the countries that want to kill its people with conventional weapons, but red light for those who wants to kill with, you know, like weapons of mass destruction. And it gives a major <laughs> credibility problem for US. And Kadir is telling me to wrap it up. So we can continue in the <laughs> question and answer session. This is the main outline of the book. Thank you very much, Kulic, about uh, this presentation. Um, Ambassador Hoff, please, thank you. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> thanks. I should uh, perhaps begin by uh, thanking Executive Director uh, Stan for the, uh, for the invitation and uh, saluting Professor uh, Kennett for a, uh, for a superb piece of work. Uh, I must say that uh, anybody who's uh, truly interested in the evolution of U.S. policy towards Syria during both the uh, George W. Bush administration and the Barack Obama administration really owes it to themselves to, uh, to have a look at this book. I was, uh, I was an actor in some of these proceedings at, uh, at one point, and I must say that, uh, that I, found, I found things in the book uh, that, I, that, I was not, uh, that I was not aware of, so I, I'd really like to commend it. Uh, you know, old, old habits die hard. I was, I was in the State Department for all of uh, three and a half years, and I, uh, I discovered there the art of doing prepared comments. So I prepared comments uh, for today's session, uh, but I'm not going to do that. I, I think that would actually be quite boring, and I'd, I'd, rather, I'd rather keep the focus on, a, on a, fine, a fine piece of work. I will say a few things about where I think policy stands right now, and I'll offer a couple of opinions about where I think it can go, what, what usefully can be done uh, to make this quintessential problem from hell uh, something, something less bad uh, than it really is. You know, going back to uh, January 2009, I was I was minding my own business as a, as a private sector CEO of a, of, a, of a very modest international business consulting firm when I got a call at home one night from our, our former Senate Majority Leader, George Mitchell, inviting me to join the Obama administration. He told me that the President had spoken to him about being some kind of a, a special envoy for Middle East peace. And I had worked with the senator uh, about 10 years before on loan from the private sector uh, when he headed a, um, an investigation into the causes of the second Palestinian intifada. Uh, we had gotten to know one another then, and he wanted me to join his team. And I think his idea was that I would serve as his deputy uh, trying to uh, negotiate a Palestinian-Israeli uh, agreement, permanent status agreement. Uh, my, own, my own interests were actually more on the Israeli-Syrian front. So when I finally came on board in April of 2009, after, after a million security clearances and questions about my taxes and my criminal terrorist affiliations, uh, I, was able to, I was able to convince him to let me take a shot at Israeli-Syrian peace mediation for the better part of two years. 
That's exactly what I did. And at the very point, almost the exact point, where I thought these negotiations were taking off and heading in the right direction, Bashar al-Assad chose the perfect unforced error. He chose to react to peaceful demonstrations against police brutality with over-the-top lethal force. It was a stupid decision. It was a totally gratuitous decision. It set Syria on the path to destruction. What, what Assad apparently had no appreciation for at the time was the latent support he could have tapped into in Syria if only he had acted as the president of the republic, if only he had decided to protect his own citizenry rather than, rather than acting, frankly, as the, as the boss of a crime family. So needless to say, the peace negotiations covered to some extent uh, in your book uh, came to an end. Our assessment and the Israeli assessment, to be honest with you, was in reacting the way he did, Bashar al-Assad cashed in his governing legitimacy. He was no longer in a position really to speak for all Syrians on matters of war and peace. And after all, a treaty of peace with Israel wouldn't have exactly been chopped liver. This would have required a lot of support from within Syria, even though the government itself was authoritarian in nature. We decided that Assad no longer had the requisite legitimacy uh, to pursue this matter. And I came to that conclusion with great sorrow because, because this was an objective that I really hope to achieve in my, in my lifetime. And I'm, I'm fully aware of the fact now that this will not happen. My immediate inclination at the time was to resign and go back to the private sector. I was asked, though, to stay on and to help the Department of State uh, organize itself to meet a new series of challenges having to do with uh, political transition in Syria. So I was at Geneva. I was one of the, uh, one of the senior U.S. negotiators for the Geneva Agreement. Uh, there came a time. I, I would guess in August or September of 2012, and I, I have to admit, I'm something of a slow learner, but, but I came to the conclusion at that point that there was precious little interest in the White House in coming up with a strategy that would implement the President's words of August 18, 2011, that Bashar al-Assad should step aside. I personally come from a background in the United States Army. For people like me, perhaps for people of my generation, for people of similar experience, the words of the Commander-in-Chief are directive in nature. The President of the United States does not issue advisory opinions or do balanced analysis of what's going on in the world. I took it very seriously that the President was saying these words. I actually opposed the saying of the words pending the creation of a strategy to make it happen. The view in the White House was it's going to happen on its own. We don't need a strategy. That view continued. I got to the point where I, I thought I had nothing further to offer. So in the fall of 2012, I left the administration, went to work uh, at the Atlantic Council, where I've been ever since, uh, writing, speaking about Syria now and related problems, ISIS, uh, the crisis in uh, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, and so forth. But I've been at the Atlantic Council of the Rafi Kariri Center 
uh, since November of 2012. Recently, uh, a commentator who I respect a lot suggested that I blame the Obama administration for what has happened in Syria and all of the consequences thereof. I have to plead not guilty to that. The person who is most responsible for the horrors we see in Syria, horrors that are now reaching well into Western Europe and up into Scandinavia, is Bashar al-Assad. It is not Barack Obama. The United States had nothing to do with stimulating warfare in Syria. At the very moment Bashar decided to open fire, I was involved in a mediation between the two sides to bring about a treaty of peace, a treaty that we thought would have had a positive effect on an Israeli-Palestinian treaty of peace, a positive effect on a Lebanese-Israeli treaty of peace, comprehensive peace between Israel and its neighbors, comprehensive peace that would have exacted major penalties of Iran by breaking that relationship uh, with Syria and with others. Barack Obama is not to blame for what's happened in Syria. Where I fault the administration comes down to two words, civilian protection, civilian protection. The United States has had means, means well short of invading and occupying Syria to throw sand into the gears of Assad's mass murder machine. Now, I understand it, I understand it completely that there are people out there, apparently including the President of the United States, who do not share my view of the humanitarian imperative. You know, if we have the ability to intervene at minimal risk and make definite changes on the ground, I'm in favor of it on humanitarian grounds. I understand the president doesn't agree with that. But look now at the policy implications of what Bashar al-Assad's virtually unopposed program of collective punishment has given rise to. We've got ISIS in Syria enjoying a safe haven from which, in June 2014, it attacked and absorbed major parts of Iraq. This is one of the consequences. Every time a barrel bomb is dropped on a, on a Syrian residential neighborhood, it is a victory for ISIS, a victory for ISIS. It enables the so-called caliph's recruitment program in Syria and around the world. As the United States pursues the president's definition of the mission, degrade and destroy ISIL, there is a gaping hole in our strategy. And it is a gaping hole that has everything to do with the Syrian side of this equation. My own personal hypothesis is that the president has avoided trying to gum up the mass murder machine, mainly because of the effects he speculated it might have on Iran during the nuclear negotiations. In other words, I believe there was fear that the Iranians might somehow be alienated if we push back against Assad, whether for humanitarian reasons or for war fighting reasons against ISIL. 
there was a fear that the Iranians might just bolt from the nuclear negotiations. My personal view, which I will readily admit is evidence free, is that Iran would have done no such thing. The supreme leader has had no reservation at all about authorizing nuclear negotiations while facilitating mass murder inside Syria. For the supreme leader, it's business as usual. I think if the United States had pushed back for the sake of saving lives and preventing Assad from doing his worst to the benefit of ISIL, the Iranians would have seen that as a cost of doing business. I personally don't think there is any way Iran would have bolted from a scenario involving sanctions relief and ultimately massive foreign direct investment. There is, there is big money involved here. And I say this as someone who's written that I don't think that Congress should block this agreement. Okay. So where are we now? American policy is currently enjoying, if that's, if that's the right word, the worst of all worlds in the battle against ISIL and the role of Syria. We have resigned ourselves to a long twilight struggle with ISIL. I personally don't believe this is the correct approach. ISIL in Syria has no natural constituency. But give this so-called caliph a year, two years, five years, 10 years to persist in Syria, and he will develop a natural constituency, especially if you combine it with Assad barrel bombs and starvation sieges. For ISIL, this is the ideal situation. What I have suggested to colleagues in government is a major US diplomatic initiative aimed at trying to bind regional ground forces starting with the Turkish army to provide the ground component in Syria that the anti-ISIL coalition needs. Chasing guys in jeeps with high performance aircraft is not the way to win decisively in a military sense. I know that if we're talking about intervention of Turkish ground forces, Jordanian ground forces, Emirati ground forces, I'm fully aware of all of the problems and complications. Fully understand the kinds of arrangements that have to be reached with Kurds and others, okay? But when you compare the difficulty of all of that with the situation we're facing now, where the Assad regime, Iran, Russia, and the caliph himself all have one common strategic objective, and that is somehow to force Barack Obama into an alliance of convenience with Bashar al-Assad. So if you compare the heavy lift I'm suggesting with the situation we're facing now, something that could lead to the utter humiliation of the President of the United States, I don't think it's so bad. But if, but if there are just two words I'd like to leave you with today, the words are civilian protection. That is the portal through which things may be possible in Syria. As long as the daily atrocities continue, there is not going to be a political process 
and there was not going to be anything resembling victory over ISIS. Well, thank you, Ambassador Hoff. Uh, Nicholas, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming today, and I want to thank Sita for hosting us in this excellent panel discussion, and Professor Connaught for his <coughs> thought-provoking book, A Tale of Four August. It's a very apt uh, title, and I'd also say it's also, Syria is also a tale of its regions. Um, one of the, one of, there are many excellent aspects of this book. One of the best aspects is that Professor Kanat captures the sort of underlying tension in U.S. policy, which is also the tension in the analytical community that has evolved to follow the Syrian civil war. Pretty much unprecedented in modern history, you have a range of individuals around the world that through social media, because the Syrian civil war is, is such an information-rich environment, have been able to analyze the minutia of, this, of the current of the conflict and then place it within the context of these higher level decisions that are being made by nation states and actors in war. And you know, uh, Ambassador Hoff made a, a very good point, is this question about natural constituency. The United States and others have been looking for a natural constituency of moderate armed opposition fighters that they could support. And that has been the underlying question throughout this process is can you have a cohesive, coherent, top-down organizational modern, moderate armed opposition movement that can then be a party to a negotiated solution that gets you to the major policy objective, which is the end of the conflict in an inclusive Syria that's post-Assad. There's been a lot of debate about whether there is a natural constituency for moderate armed opposition. And my, my uh, conjecture on that point is that it depends where you look. There's been a lot of attention paid currently to the fact the United States really has no partners on the ground in Syria. That the United States has to, through the Department of Defense, forge a new Syria force and then take that new Syria force and insert it in the north. But a lot, a lot less attention has been paid to the fact that there's also a concurrent supply and support program that's been predominantly run through the Central Intelligence Agency and other uh, allied nations in the region that supply weapons and limited training to armed groups on the ground, such as the Southern Front in Dara, on the border of Jordan and Israel, such as groups such as Sukhur al Gab in the western province of Hama, which is literally on the, uh, the doorstep of core regions to support for Assad, and also the famous Euphrates Volcano Front, which met the policy objective of taking the fight to ISIS, met the policy objective of supporting a coherent Arab and Kurdish multi-ethnic armed force, but didn't quite meet the policy objective of getting pressure on Assad to bring a negotiated solution to the end of the conflict. And I think this is the issue moving forward, is that with all the attention that's been paid to the weakness currently of the train and equip program, who are the allies on the ground that the United States can empower? There are, and the, the, the calling card of these allies are the Tau missiles. Where you see the tow missiles, you see potential allies to the United States. The question is, can they form the nucleus of an armed opposition force that can then be party to negotiations? At this stage in, in, this stage in time, that's a very open question. And then to build off that point is that how do you get these communities that have supported Assad? Because this conflict, as it's worn on, as it's become a conflict of communities, as it's become a stark choice of you either side with Assad and you, you side with this memory of the republic, this memory of something that was more pluralistic, more inclusive, or you side with the armed opposition and you side with the force that has become increasingly polarized, has become increasingly mental issues, such as how do you deal with the over $20 billion of damage and destruction that has been done to that country's infrastructure, its economy, its ability to function as a state after the war. It doesn't get you to how do you get, de get to the point where you can have reconciliation, demilitarization, demobilization, reintegration of communities. This is the stark reality that faces us right now. So I would say that you know, moving forward, the United States will have to be patient. I think there is great wisdom in the fact that the only way to get a successful conclusion to this conflict is to be able to build out a coherent armed opposition force. However, that coherent armed opposition force is not, going to, is not going to be focused in one region of the country. It will have to develop slowly. It will have to have a beachhead. It will have to be able to demonstrate that it can provide governance. It will have to demonstrate that it can deal with thorny issues 
such as how do you reintegrate communities that side with Assad, and how do you bring them back into the fold of a society that's outside of Assad's purview, but is also not under the Sharia state that has sprouted up in regions of the country that have fallen under rebel rule. And this is the problem. There are no models right now that can be taken to regime loyalist communities and said, see, this is something you can follow. Here, in this area of the country, say Dara in the south, or around Aleppo in the north, or in Haseke in the northeast, we have a functioning opposition-led governance that has opposition police forces, that has an op opposition security state, and it is supported by an international coalition that wants to see a post assad here. We don't have that model. We're getting to the point now where we are trying to build up the capacity of local forces to, to provide that model, but we don't have it. And that is the next step. That is the next essential step for the United States. If it has decided that it wants to continue to put skin in the game in Syria, and it's decided that the development of a, of a, a conflict that isn't going away, that has become a run-in wound in the central core areas of the Middle East, that has created refugee in, influx in, wet in Europe, in broader areas of the Middle East, that is destabilizing, how do you bring an end to that conflict? The only way you bring an end to that conflict is to provide a model of alternate governance. So we've spent so much attention in the North, but perhaps we should look South. Perhaps we should look at the development of the Southern Front. Perhaps we should see if the United States, through concerted influence with allied actors such as Jordan, can actually bring about a charter, a model of governance that can then be presented the issue, the other, the issue related to that is that with so much attention focused on ISIS and confronting ISIS and less attention on confronting Assad, it feeds into this narrative that the United States is only concerned about ISIS, is only concerned about the, the image, the optics of the loss of Iraq and has taken its eye off of Syria and the human suffering there. And that is, that is going to complicate our ability to interact with the armed opposition moving forward. So I would say that at this st stage, when the United States is able to present an area of Syria where you have a model of armed opposition governance <laughs> that can then get the buy-in from loyalist communities that have fallen out of Assad's control, you will then see that first step towards an effective strategy in Syria. Well, thank you, Nicholas. So uh, we have a, I think, good summary of what's happened and what's going on today. Uh, a few ideas about choices in Syria for the U.S. policy, but um, there is a there is an interesting um, sort of um, overarching argument so far is that there has been quite a bit of rhetorical things that were said by the administration, but it was never really uh, supported by policy, and then the uh, ambassador has a has a recommendation to 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 somehow mobilize the regional actors to uh, to provide for that ground forces. And then, Nicholas, you're discussing uh, drawing up a um, national uh, sort of force, but over time. And it's it, I think there's a bit of a um, problem with the idea of who is going to do the fighting on the ground. US force wears uh, no boots on the ground. And now whether it's going to be regional actors or the Syrian forces that are already fighting, somehow you can unite them. And um, maybe we can focus on this uh, right now if you were to. And I'm assuming with this, of course, that you think that a, a, U, a force on the ground that's aligned with US policy will somehow help US policy. Uh, on Syria, right? You, it will either stabilize the situation or help uh, demobilization, reconciliation eventually, etc. So, assuming these factors, can you focus and maybe each of you respond to this policy question today? If the U.S. is not able to provide boots on the ground, uh, is it going to be regional powers or the Syrian uh, forces mm -hmm. or? or a combination of both, et cetera. Maybe briefly, I'll, I'll take your opinion on that. Khalid Sattar, starting with you. Well, uh, I think even before uh, starting to discuss who will, whose boots will be on the ground, I think the most challenging thing for the Syrian opposition and the situation on the ground is a game-changer U.S. policy, and uh, probably a, a regain credibility. 
So even from now, if President Obama is going to change his policy, probably it will not be very appealing for opposition forces. Because uh, what we see is there is constant rhetorical statements, but there is no strategy behind that. So there was train and equip program, which I don't know what, at what point is that, you know, like the, how many total trained. It was 60, then they disappeared in Syria. There's a lot of questions about that. Red line statement. So all of these statements actually contributed and become a recruiting ground for groups like ISIS. Because ISIS becomes a group, you know, like for the people in the opposition, a group that can deliver, these radical organizations that can deliver. And when they see President Obama and US administration is doing nothing, and after these four years, it will be really hard to mobilize these forces in order to create another uh, ground troops or another fighting force. So two more things. For me, uh, since the beginning of the administration, if the what I understand from the book, actually, this is just a, an addition for my previous uh, remark. Uh, what is Obama's strategy? Because there was constantly question, and what it, when I ask, you know, like in this town, I interviewed more than 30 people. Some people from the administration, it, uh, they were in the administration. Some, they were in the State Department. And when I ask the question of uh, what is the U.S. strategy in Syria, I keep getting the look that is there a strategy behind, you know, like the in Syria, right? And then I started to ask what is U.S. policy in Syria, right? And they look at me and they again tell me is there a policy in Syria? So even in this town, we have a problem that even if President Obama tells this, it, will, it doesn't mean that it will happen. So the most significant this thing at this point is to regain US credibility. And this is also relevant for the allies as well. So even if U US want to mobilize the regional actors, if US <coughs> goes with this plan, it will probably, you know, like the, the regional actors will have a lot of question marks. Because we know that in 2012, when Hillary Clinton went with this plan, he went with Turkish Turkey, right? Met with Ahmed Davutoglu at that time, uh, uh, foreign minister, and they also had a conference call with uh, British and French uh, foreign ministers, and it was already, you know, like everybody thought that this was cooked. Now there will be a, you know, like the a new U.S. strategy arming moderate rebels, you know, like the, so that it will not be, you know, like the radicals will not be powerful, etc. But then the, it stopped at the White House. We have similar thing in 2013 when Kerry became Secretary of State, and Secretary Kerry had these kind of plans, but this time it turned back from General Dempsey, right? So we constantly have these plans, but before, you know, like the, even starting to talk about the plans, we should, you know, like the kind of the international community, regional actors, and Syrian opposition need to believe that there will be something really this time it will happen. So I think this is going to be more challenging than, you know, like the training Syrians or, you know, like the kind of bringing the regional actors together. That's my. Thank you. I think uh, I think I think Nicholas has uh, made the uh, made the key points here. Uh, the Syrian opposition needs. Beachhead, where a uh, model of alternate governance can be established. Look, if you're if you're an Alawite, if you're a Christian, maybe if you're an Ismaili, the question you're asking yourself before you take a walk on Bashar al-Assad is, what is the alternative here? Everybody knows that Assad is not an attractive alternative. Everybody knows that Bashar al-Assad is the death of Syria. And yet, and yet, what is the alternative? My sense is that the beachhead ought to be that part of Syria from which ISIS is swept. Okay. We, I, I agree totally with the point that, that it's in our peril only to emphasize ISIS and not the Assad regime. I get that totally. But ISIS 
and its degradation and destruction have been identified by the President as our national objective. Are we going to wait to train Syrians who are willing to fight ISIS and not the regime? I presume we can do better than 54 or 60 a year, but it's still going to be a long, long, long wait to put together a requisite ground component to accompany coalition aircraft. Can the Kurdish YPD militia do this? Can it clear ISIS from all of eastern Syria? No, it cannot. Hence, my suggestion that we at least try the diplomatic heavy lift of binding regional ground forces to this objectives to this objective, and it would involve the establishment in eastern Syria, appropriately in Raqqa, perhaps, of a new Syrian government. A Syrian government that would be recognized by the Friends of the Syrian People group, including the London 12, the London 11. A government with which the United States and others would establish security assistance relationships a government that could build a true Syrian national stabilization force. And I would suggest that if we can get to that scenario, what we've also done is establish a basis for all Syrian negotiations. You would have two parties, two significant parties, inside Syria instead of a regime that's just kept on life support by Iran and Russia on the one hand, and a, and a collection of exiles in Turkey and elsewhere on the other. So, so I think, uh, in, in effect, a flock of birds can be killed with one stone here. But, but it's going to take a, an incredible diplomatic heavy lift. It cannot be done by the Secretary of State on his own as a one-man show. It cannot be done by one White House staffer skulking around. Uh, this, is, this is going to take the President and his national security team mobilizing the talent that really does exist in the Department of State and in other departments and agencies of government. Just to build off of the points made by my colleagues, you know, the United States has a terrible terrain to deal with in the North. The North is very important just because of the demographic weight that it holds, the potential economic weight that it holds, the significance of Aleppo uh, as a city, the, the, the symbolic nature of being able to, as Ambassador Hoff mentioned, create a new Syrian governance in the area that's been vacated by ISIS where has been, ISIS has been displaced from would be, have tremendous symbolic and also practical value. The problem has been in the north is that the terrain there is very inhospitable, at least the social terrain has been inhospitable. The United States tried with Harakat Hazm to create a movement that was moderate, was supplied, was supported, and it was and it collapsed because the because other armed opposition groups such as Jabhat al Nusra or Al Qaeda in Syria, call a duck a duck, Al Qaeda in Syria, and other fellow travelers, many of whom are jih jihadist groups from throughout the region in the Caucasus acted forcefully against them and have acted forcefully to try to limit, we saw this with Division 30, the social terrain in which US-backed groups can operate. And so ISIS is an important battle. The perhaps more important battle in the North is to then come up with a coherent, co coherent policy towards Jabhat al-Nusra. We've listed it as a terrorist organization. We understand the, 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 the importance it has in joint rebel operations rooms. But perhaps the United States should have a more forward lean-in lean in policy in terms of, okay, how do you address the Jabhat al-Nusra dilemma? Because in the wake of Jaysh al-Fatha, the, the conquering army that recently swept through Idlib governorate, you have Jabhat al-Nusra trying to lay down the roots of the Sharia state. And that's going to be another, it is another active competitor against the United States and its allies creating an alternate form of governance in the north, which is such an important space. The South is another terrain where potentially you could create an altered form of governance. 
if the United States took the policy position that it would work with its allies to impose a no-fly zone over Dara, Sueda, and the South, it could potentially give that space from the barrel bombs, from the destruction, to allow a truly, to this point at least, moderate form of Syrian opposition governance to form. But in terms of the North, where all the attention is paid, we need to be more forward-leaning against Jabhat al-Nusra, and we need to have actual repercussions for groups that side with Jabhat al-Nusra against groups that we have, have decided represent the best vision for Syria moving forward, which is an inclusive Syria that acknowledges its diversity and acknowledges it's historically been diverse, and is not trying to refash Syria in the image of an al-Qaeda-led Sharia state. OK. Um, well, let me turn to the audience, and let's take some questions. I have questions, but I'll, I'll, I want to give them a chance. Uh, wait for the microphone. Can you pass the microphone right there and then here? First, first you, okay. sir. Me first? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tyler Thompson. I'm the policy director for United for a Free Syria. Um, so, Nick, you mentioned the uh, issues of, of credibility um, from, from the U.S. Uh, as a necessary component to start getting the, the ground forces together. And <clears throat> I would just submit that, you know, from my conversations with a lot of rebel groups, particularly in the South, um, the number one sort of credibility gap is the lack of civilian protection from, from the United States. Um, so I guess my question for the panel is, you know, as a, where would the civilian protection come in uh, to the equation, uh, and should it be the first step uh, of, of whatever process uh, we go forward with? Thanks. Please, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Michael Kurtzik, formerly of USDA. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Huge Bay, excellent, excellent review of Ambassador Hoff. If I may make a comment of Ambassador Hoff, you remind me of my own dealings with the Israelis and Palestinians 30, 40 years ago when I sat in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, talking to them, and the Israeli pulled me over and said, look, Mike, there hasn't been peace here in 5,000 years. Why now? <laughs> and I said to him, Amir, I understand what you're saying, but if I believed what you're saying, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. And so we continued the discussion. A question. Ambassador Hoff, you just mentioned Russia only once in the last moment over here. But the Russians are expanding and building the Damascus airport now. Uh, could you comment on their roles? And the other thing I've heard is that the French have said they will send a military force into Syria. Is that the beginning of an allied effort, of a UN effort, to, to do something with this catastrophe, which I have said a number of times, nobody in Hollywood writing for Alfred Hitchcock or Lance Sterling could write a script of what's going on in the Middle East today. It's the inmates inside of, in, in charge of the insane asylum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nicholas, I would say that you know, and it's taken. I would say that you know, recently, the ICG came out with an excellent analysis where they said that at this stage in the conflict, perhaps the imposition of a no-fly zone over the south would be a step forward in terms of the right to protect the civilian population. That you know, the Assad regime has had the opportunity to refrain from bombing civilian areas and hasn't. And I would say that there's a lot of logic to that. That if, if, in, if the if taken the south in the context, if you feel that, that this is a place in Syria where you can have a genuine model that is built out, and this, is, this model can then be applied nationwide, and that you can then calibrate, because this is a cure, can you calibrate it to include enough parties that you don't have reverse ethnic conflict occur, you don't have reverse ethnic and sectarian cleansing, then begin to take the steps to do that. Because at some point, this conflict is going to need to end, because as, it, as it's run in now, Without its, without its end, more people are being killed, more people are being displaced, more and more billions of dollars of damage are being assessed to Syria, and you could have a country that's a basket case for more than half a century. And the Syrian people certainly don't deserve that, and I like to believe in my extensive experience dealing, working alongside and knowing Syrians that they can have a better future. So if we have reached this point in the conflict where the Assad regime refrain, cannot refrain from targeting civilians, then perhaps it is time then to look at the best place for which to have a maximum effect for the future development of Syria to impose a no-fly zone. Yes, uh, I, I, I think on the, on the question of civilian protection and when does it kick in, it kicks in now. Because, because without it, you can't get the first base any place else. There are all kinds of analysts out there who have some very, very interesting <coughs> ideas about how you would manage political transition, 
in Syria, da 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 da. With the daily atrocities going on, you don't get to any kind of a Syrian dialogue. If you don't believe me, you can ask Stefan de Mistura, the UN Special, Special Envoy, anybody else who's worked on this program, on this problem. You get, you get nowhere. Kofi Annan, two, two years ago, three years ago, in the build up to Geneva, had a six point proposal, a six point plan, whereby the regime would have taken a few de escalatory steps, the opposition would have taken some steps. The regime agreed to do it and then did not implement. But the message here from Kofi Annan, you can't get anywhere politically, diplomatically, without de-escalation. The physics of this, of this thing just, just can't be repealed. Where we start, I think, I, mean, I always believe start, start with the diplomatic option. Iran and Russia have it in their power to take their client out of the business of mass murder. We should give them an opportunity to do that without holding our breath, expecting something positive to happen from these particular actors. And as far as, as, far as Russia, I think from the point of view of the U.S. government right now, and most, most people I know, the, uh, the tactical purposes of the Russian buildup are not clear yet. Is this merely meant to reassure Assad's military forces who have taken some reverses lately? Do the Russians <coughs> intend to provide tactical air support to Assad's forces against Syrian rebels? Do they intend to start engaging um, ISIS targets? This is all opaque. No, nobody really knows yet. But, but what I think it does, and this has come as a tremendous wake-up call, if not a slap in the face to the administration, is it puts an end to this illusion that the Russians try to encourage us to have that from their point of view, they're not wedded to Assad, that Assad might be expendable? No. That should go away. From the point of view of President Vladimir Putin, the continuation of Bashar al-Assad is an ongoing, rolling humiliation for the President of the United States. He wants him there, and he'll do what it takes, everything in his power, to keep him there. Ambassador, can I just, one thing about the diplomacy, right? Uh, many people at, in the administration or close to the administration would say, well, we've tried and it didn't work because Russians and Iranians aren't interested, Russia used its veto, etc. cetera. So you, what kind of, how do you see it happening different? I don't think uh, we, I don't, uh, thank you, I don't think we've really tried mm -hmm. on something very directly focused on civilian protection. We, look, the, most, the most important power right now for the preservation of the Assad regime is Iran, okay? What Secretary of State Kerry has said publicly is that, well, you know, we'll, we'll engage the Iranians once, once the nuclear deal is, is finalized, okay? Now, why? Why would we not have been speaking with Tehran about this humanitarian abomination inside Syria for the past two years, at least, because it would have distracted us from the, from the nuclear objectives? I don't know, but we haven't tried. Most of our, most of our discussions with the Russians have been in, in pursuit of this will-o'-the-wisp will of, a, uh, of, a, of, a, of, an, of an agreement on political transition. But again, even though you know, I was at Geneva, I was you know, part of the Geneva final communique, I think it's a good formula. But it, but it lacks importance. It lacks relevance as long as the civilian slaughter continues.
Thank you. A couple things about civilian protection. I think we have to take this discussion about civilian protection a little broader than, I know it looks now too ambitious, but civilian protection will not only be achieved through safe zones or no-fly zones. Because even in refugee camps or, you know, like the Syrians living in different countries, we see that considerable amount of, you know, like the not very good feelings about what's going on in Syria. And this is a basically emerging a huge diaspora that are not happy with the situation and that, uh, that they will not be satisfied with settling in one of these countries. They will constantly want a solution in the conflict in Syria. So in terms of safe zones debates, we had these debates in 2012 when Steve Simon was in NSC. And he came up with a safe zone idea, but it never worked. John McCain several times offered safe zones, didn't work. Now we see that, you know, like especially in Turkish border areas, there is a discussion about safe zones, possibility of safe zones. But again, the problem of credibility, the problem of whether should we believe that if it were, you know, like the same problem that train and equipped forces have, because they were thinking, you know, they are following U.S. foreign policy better than anyone in U.S., I guess. They are looking at, are, are we going to be at another Bay of Pigs, right? It, it, United States will train us, but you know, like how about air cover? So there are too many questions about the U.S. decisiveness about this, a clear strategy, a policy. It, it doesn't need to be very aggressive, very assertive, but there is a clear policy that President and the White House and the administration will back and kind of support the idea. And secondly, in terms of Russia, it, I, I was trying to follow for the last four days I read probably 50 different conspiracy theories about what Russia is trying to do. But, uh, the, you know, like because nobody is clear about the uh, uh, thing, but all open sources, people, you know, now we have social media intelligence agents almost, you know, like who follow this, they start to track down these units and they keep saying that, well, there is a, a close uh, a position that there's a ceasefire in Ukraine right now. And a ceasefire in Ukraine will if there would be a successful ceasefire, it would it could damage Putin's credibility as anti-Western, you know, like the uh, and diminish his rally around the flag effect in uh, Ukraine. Because of that, most of the units that are being moved to Syria right now are units that are in Ukraine right now. So this is, you know, but Russia needs to understand that it has a very good Afghanistan experience. That you know, like the how you know, like the supporting a pro-Russian, you know, like the government in the capital will not help the stabilization of the country, but when you leave after a certain point, after bleeding a little bit, when you leave it, it will create a huge black spot that can export all kinds of insecurities to the region and international security as well. If uh, I just jump in quickly on the Russia question, which I didn't uh, address, I will say I agree with my colleagues on that point. I will say, however, that we shouldn't underestimate the social and military power of the Assad regime and that playing into potential Russian calculus. You know, regardless of whether the United States likes it or not, at this point, the Assad regime is still the strongest militia force in Syria. It still has a patchwork presence throughout the country. It still has a base of power in Aleppo. It still has a base of power in the Far East in Hasekye. And ironically enough, the Assad regime is the only anti-ISIS force that's actually training and recruiting local tribal fighters in core ISIS areas in eastern Syria. So we just need to keep that in perspective that if, if the Russians are escalating their involvement in the Syrian conflict, they are doing it in the context of they have a potentially effective base to keep this war going on for a long time with Assad and the communities that support him. Thank you, Nicholas. We'll take a couple more questions if you have one over there. Oh, yeah. Go ahead and then pass it. Up. I'll pass it after. Hello, my, my name is Altay Malazgir, uh, Turkish Coalition of America. So uh, in the latest edition of the Foreign Affairs Journal, uh, which was a special edition on uh, President Obama's foreign policy record, um, Gideon, Gideon Rose alludes to the idea of uh, the United States' core and periphery interests when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, so um, for example, a core interest would be Iran. He talked about you know, uh, finding peace with them when he came in to office in 2009. And obviously, we saw that that culminated in a nuclear agreement with them on July 14th. Uh, a periphery interest would be um, a country like Ukraine. We saw that um, after Russia moved into Crimea. Um, since Ukraine was not part of NATO, um, the US did not really have um, uh, a robust reaction to that in terms of you know, a reaction, I mean. So, 
and Kanat Bey, this is a better question for you, I believe. So in terms of Syria, is this a core or periphery interest to the Obama administration? And going back to the Bush administration, was it core or was it periphery? And how does that reflect on the actions that the Obama administration took or the inactions? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Charlotte Beck. I work here for the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, which is a German uh, political foundation in town. Um, I have two follow-up questions for Ambassador Hawk. Um, one of them is on um, the impact of the Iran deal on um, the Obama administration. And you alluded to the fact that during the negotiations, the um, administration was uh, very worried about um, uh, complicating their relationship with with Iran, of course, and therefore very hesitant to act on Syria. Do you see that now that we have a deal, the same fear applies, but not to the negotiations, but to the implementation of the deal? So um, is the Obama administration still as hesitant um, uh, to confront uh, Iran on, on Assad now that we have a deal, or do you see an opening um, there? And then the second question alludes to the role of Europe. Um, um, obviously, we have this uh, huge uh, refugee crisis at the moment, and, and European leaders, um, amongst them Merkel and Poland, are, are very concerned um, about the, the refugee flow. So, do you see um, in the current discussion more action from or more pressure from the side of, of the European, European governments on the, the um, U.S. administration um, to again revisit the question of, of safe zones, um, um, which is, I guess, like a uh, less complicated, uh, maybe, um, policy step than uh, the uh, regional um, stabilization force that you suggested. Thank you. So, um, who should we start with? Kulich. Mine will be Kulich. short. So, the person who should answer that question will be Ambassador Hope because he, is, <laughs> he was in, the, in those discussions about the, the U.S. foreign policy priorities in the first years of the Obama administration. But what I see is, you know, both for Bush administration and uh, Obama administration, it was a peripheral, it wasn't central interest. The central interest for uh, President Bush was Iraq, the war in Iraq, so Syria meant something uh, peripherally to support that goal. And because of that, the action in Syria related to uh, the conflict in Iraq. And Ob for Obama administration, as Ambassador Hoff said, both withdrawing troops from Iraq and having this nuclear deal Iran. So inaction in Syria was peripheral. It was important, but not to change the real track of the foreign policy, which is withdrawing forces from Iraq and having a nuclear deal from, with Iran. Yeah, I, I would say uh, uh, Syria, on its own terms, would, would be a uh, peripheral issue, even though it's been a central part of my life. It's a, it's a peripheral issue. It became a core issue when the President of the United States began to make definite statements about the situation. Calling on Assad to step aside, establishing red lines, that made it a core issue because that goes to the credibility and reputation of the United States. So it became a core issue. Uh, the, impact, the impact of the uh, Iran deal, you know, I'm told I'm told by people in the United States government that there is an opening, uh, that, there, that there is, within the administration, there's very clear awareness of the relationship between Assad policies of collective punishment and the well-being of ISIL. Okay. This, is, this is clearly, clearly understood. I'm told that there, that there is a variety of um, means under consideration, possibly to render some, some kind of protective services to, uh, to Syrian civilians. But you know, I, I hope it's true, and I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, role of Europe. I think the main thing Europe can do right now is back the United States in making civilian protection the top policy priority in Syria. And this is not just a matter of holding Uncle Sam's coat while we do all the heavy lifting. Most of the leaders 
of Western Europe have enabled the situation we find ourselves in today. They've been quite willing to dismiss the whole Syrian problem, you know, saying things like, well, you know, there's no military solution to Syria. Gee, there really ought to be a diplomatic outcome here. Without, and, and I, I would accept the French from this, the French have consistently, consistently pushed the White House to put some action behind the verbiage. I can't say that for the, for the rest of Western Europe. I was told by a senior European diplomat a couple of years ago, a fellow who really was a bit of an activist on Syria, he said, Fred, you've got to understand the typical European attitude towards Syria is whatever is happening there, let it happen as long as it stops at Turkey. Well, guess what? It's not stopping at Turkey anymore. Thank you. Nicholas, do you have anything to add? No, I think oh, that was handled very well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I guess we'll stop there, but I want to once again congratulate my colleague on the book and advise any of you, if you're interested on uh, Syria policy or non-policy, take a look at the book. And I really want to thank my uh, panel, Ambassador Hoff and Nicholas. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, please join me in uh, congratulating. Thank you. Thank you.